you know, you hear about it and then you go, well, you know, okay, let, let me see it for myself, you know. And so that was kind of my attitude going into it. And I, I went the first day and this is, it's kind of an interesting picture because it's probably like, uh, who knows, I could be in there <laughs> somewhere, but uh, basically we sat down in that middle row on the first day, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning and we sat there, Katie and I sat there and we were with our friend Laura. And the next day we were supposed to go to Laura's house to watch the Super Bowl. And I was like, yeah, that'll be cool, you know? Check this revival thing out and then I'll go watch the Super Bowl, you know? It'll be a great weekend, you know? And then uh, little did I know that when I sat down there that I was gonna be part of something so special and that I felt so blessed that God had brought me there. I, I felt so favored. I felt so loved by God that he would put me in that position to be in a place like that where the Holy Spirit was just moving and the Holy Spirit was present. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling where you just walked into a room and you knew the Holy Spirit was working in a powerful way. Has anybody felt that way about a, an atmosphere that they walk into? They, maybe you're a feeler and you can just sense like, oh, the Holy Spirit is working here. He's, he's power. I can just feel it. it's like thick. There's a presence. That's kind of how it was. And as I was sitting there, I, I was like, man, I don't really want to get up. You know? <laughs> I just, I just want to just want to soak in this and then so you know time was going by and then our friend Laura turns around and goes hey by the way if you guys want to stay I'm fine you don't have to come watch the Super Bowl you can stay and I was like yes, <laughs> yes. thank you Jesus like I want this I want to stay I want to just soak in it and that's what I did and and then uh, as I'm like, wait, what am I doing? Like, where am I going to stay? I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to do. Like, who, this is crazy. Like, okay. Um, and I'm like, just, just, just stay, just, just keep praying. And then they would, uh, so basically to give you a little outline of what Asbury was, it was very simple. There was like no agenda. There was, nobody planned this out. They didn't have like a meeting of the minds and they're like, okay guess what at 10 o'clock the holy spirit's gonna show up you know and then at 11 o'clock we're gonna no it was not it was just like uh, just a little backstory of how it started it actually started because uh, every monday wednesday and friday the students are required to come to chapel and and they bring in a speaker and they pray together and it's really just almost like becomes part of what they do. Almost like you could imagine us going to daily mass and being like, all right, time to go to daily mass. Oh, all right, that was amazing. Let me go on my day. They're like, yeah, I'm going to chapel. And Zach gave this sermon. He's self-admittedly said, man, I thought it was like one of the worst sermons I ever gave. I, I have... I like walked away from there. I called my wife and I was like, man, I just gave a terrible sermon. I wasn't prepared, all this stuff. But he did something. He goes, if, if the Lord is touching you, I want you to stay. And what he did is he asked the other, well, about 19 students stayed and they just started to pray. And as they prayed and they, as they started to repent of their way of life where they had gone astray like we talked about you know wherever i've you know sought satisfaction in other places and not sought that satisfaction from jesus you know they they felt that they felt like any like many college students now like yes i'm chasing after this thing and they turned they made a moment and they turned towards the lord and there was 19 of them and they did this as a they're like we're, we're gonna stay here and we're gonna pray and they didn't know what they were going to do. And they just started to pray. And an amazing thing happened. The Holy Spirit started to touch them all. And uh, they started uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit. They started getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
and none of them wanted to leave. And then word got out, and some of the students like came back in the chapel. They're like, "Hey, did you hear? They're still in there praying. The whole, something's going on." And then more people came. Like an hour later, there's a hundred people. And then those people, the same thing. The Holy Spirit was falling on them. And uh, a few hours after that, there was like a few hundred people. And then by the end of the night, that night, that whole chapel was full. And it was, it, I think it holds over a thousand people, like 1,500 people, something like that. The whole chapel was full. And by 10 at night, word had gotten out that there was a revival happening. And uh, they stayed all night, worshiped all night, 24 hours. And then, you know, everybody thought, well, okay, you know, this will fade out. It didn't. The next day, they came back. They kept worshiping. And like I said, by the time I got there on Saturday, this is what the scene looked like. And I didn't want to leave either. And then so I go up and I receive prayer from somebody. Little did I know that it was Zach, the guy who preached the first sermon. I was like, hey, man, can you pray for me? And he gives this awesome prayer. And at the end, he's like, hey, man, if you need a place to stay, let me know. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus, you know? And I'm like, oh, by the way, who are you? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm the guy that, like, preached, I was asked to preach the first sermon, and I was like, oh, Lord, you just, like, you're so good. You know, you connect people, and you put people in the right place. And so I just kept coming back, and uh, what ended up happening was I stayed there for 12 days. You know, only a couple times I like made a couple visits uh, back home, you know, but I just, it's like I couldn't stay away. I was like telling other people. And actually one of the guys later on that I told is David, he's right here. He ended up coming later on and his aunt. Uh, so it was really amazing. I just couldn't stay. Not only this, but this was really cool. That first day when I walked out, uh, there was just so much happening. I'm like, man, I got to go for a walk. I got to get a break. And uh, so we walk outside, and there's this girl. She's got this big uh, leg brace on. And she's probably like 12, 13 years old, you know. And she's kind of limping up with her family, and we start talking to them. And they, I was like, oh, what happened? And uh, she goes, Oh, I messed my knee up. We, we drove six hours to get here. We heard about the revival and we had to come, you know, and uh, my leg is killing me. Like I drove six hours and my leg is just like killing. I go, whoa, God is doing amazing things in there. People are getting healed like crazy. There's no reason he can't heal you right now. So Katie and I decide to pray for this girl, you know, and uh, she's like getting better. Uh, she takes the, uh, we pray again. She takes the brace off and she's like walking perfectly fine, you know, no pain, nothing. She's got like tears coming down. It was just so beautiful. She was healed of whatever was bothering. I don't even know complications. Like I said, took the brace off. She was healed. And it was really funny because this lady saw us praying and she's like, well, you guys really know how to pray. <laughs> you know, we need people to pray. There's like, at that point, there were so many people coming that it was just like, they were overwhelmed. Like I said, they didn't have it planned out. They just needed people to pray. And uh, next thing you know, I ended up on prayer teams. So it was really cool. We, so every single day I'd come back and I'd be on this prayer team and back to just this whole rhythm of asbury i'm going to explain to you what that was like because i think it was so beautiful um, it was so simple it, it was not like some big master plan it was just basic back to the basics and here was the first thing is the preaching was very simple it was not this eloquent preaching uh, usually this is what would happen. Somebody would get up there and then they would preach the simple gospel. You know, that Jesus uh, came to save you of your sins. That you have turned, that you've like fallen, you've turned away from God. That uh, Jesus wants to forgive you of your sins. He died on a cross for you. 
He shed his blood for you on a cross. He loves you. He wants to forgive you of your sins. There's nothing that you can do that would ever change the fact that Jesus loves you that much. He shed his blood for you to cleanse you of that sin so that you could live a new life. He died and he was in the tomb three days and he rose again. He didn't stay dead. He, Jesus is alive. He rose. He rose to life so he could give you new life. And then he ascended into heaven. Not that he could leave you alone, but because he's seated on the throne, interceding uh, with the Father for you. And so that he could send the Holy Spirit to live inside you, to live a new life full of power. And then every single time that they would do that, they would call people to repentance. And it didn't matter if it was one person in that whole thing. That hand would go up. And it would be like, man, it was so awesome. It would be like this huge cheer. It would be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like another person gave their life to Jesus. And it was, I mean, when I read the scriptures and I always read that verse of uh, all of heaven rejoices when just one sinner repents, right? I always heard those words, but that was the closest I ever felt to realizing what heaven's going to be like at the repentance of one sinner. And it was awesome. Like, and they would bring them up. They'd give these testimonies. And it was just, yeah, it was just amazing. You know, people were like, yes, God is moving. God is calling people to repentance. And then after that, usually they would have something like, hey, uh, we just invite you to come up and give a Bible verse, you know, uh, a life verse. If you have a, a Bible verse that's important to you. Uh, we don't want you to get up and give this whole exegesis about what you think it means and all this. No, just the pure word, because we believe the word of God is like a double-edged sword that it pierces to the heart, right? They believe that scripture had the power to convert people just by the word, just by reading the word of God out loud. That's what we're going to do. So what they did is every, they'd have these two people with microphones on each side of the altar, and then there would be this big line that would come up. And they'd take like, you know, 10 people on each side, and that's literally what they did. They'd come up with their Bibles and just read the verse. And then the next person would come up. They would read the verse. And then the next person, and they would read the verse. And people just began, again, began to weep, be baptized in the Holy Spirit, just by reading the Word of God. Just reading the Word of God. Because why? It was living and effective. And what we saw is many times it would be the scripture passage that that person would read it might be the exact verse that that uh, person that god gave to that other person that day and it would be like some obscure verse it would just be like god you are real you are so alive again the word is alive it is effective it is true right and this is what was happening they didn't again we complicate things right we open this bible up and then we think we have to complicate things and have like all these people explain it to us uh which is is good that you're doing that but how about just reading the word of god how about believing in the power of the word of god that it goes out that it waters the earth and then it returns and it does not return void right do we believe that about the word of god Simple. This is what was happening at Asbury. Just reading the Word of God. And then I loved it. Every time they would read the Word of God, they would, they would say, and this is the Word of God, and everybody would say, we believe it. We believe it. Again, it's not, you can hear the Word of God. That's one thing. Anybody can hear the Word of God. But is your response when you hear the Word of God, I believe it. 
Can you just say that right now? Uh, I believe it. Say it again. I believe it. One more time. I believe it. Is this true in your life? Is this true in your life? When you open up the Bible and you read from the scriptures, do you believe every single thing that is in there? And if you do, I promise, it's, it's going to change your life. This is the single biggest thing in my life that has changed my life, that has taken me from the depths of darkness into just so much joy, so much light, so much freedom, is because when I first started reading the Word of God over 17 years ago, I actually believed it. And I encourage you to do the same thing, that, that when you read the Word of God, to believe it, to believe in the promises of God. And it, it was not rocket science. Lives were being changed by reading the Word of God. And then, uh, after something like that, they would just start to worship again. It's like, well, what do we do now? I don't know, uh, let's just worship. You know, and then they would start to worship, and they didn't even have lyrics up on screen, nothing. They were just like, uh, bringing up these college students who were literally just like, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I could play guitar, you know? And they, it was not like a professional worship band, nothing like that. They're just like rolling in these uh, bands that literally, I don't know, they probably just play together on the weekends or something. And something amazing happened. It wasn't just them worship, it was the Holy Spirit leading them. And then the whole place would start to sing. The whole place in unison would, would start to worship. And it was, it was uh, I just can't even describe it. It was just, they would, the whole place would just reach this crescendo of unity. And it was, uh, it was like the heavens just opened up. It was like that praise, that praise that everybody was, uh, that the Holy Spirit was working and, everybody at the same time to be in unison to sing the same songs of worship to God we're going up to heaven like incense and then it would like rip open this uh, torrent of grace and there would be times when like I would just literally feel like a shaking like they would reach this crescendo and I the person next to me would just like fall down shaking under the power of God and it would happen every single day. Every single day, it was like, it was just this, uh, it wasn't like, oh, the Holy Spirit's here. Uh, oh man, I wish you would come back. Like I, I felt, it was just like ebbs and flows. And like the Holy Spirit would come in power and then they, he would like kind of put you into this sweet presence and people were, uh, we're just receiving this beautiful outpouring. They call it now an outpouring. They no longer call it a revival. They say, this is the Asbury outpouring. And that's what it was. It was this beautiful outpouring of the Holy Spirit that God was touching his people that were so wounded, so broken. And who were the broken people? Who were the people that were the most wounded, the most broken? It was Gen Z. Gen Z is maybe unlike any other generation that has lived on this planet. We are literally talking about kids that are born, uh, you know, and they have grown up with technology, screens, news, constant bombardment of people's opinions, classmates, um, bullying on their social media accounts, uh, all these different things that no other generation has had to face, right? That no matter if, how hard we tried, we might have an idea of it, but imagine if like that was your only reality. Like you didn't know anything different. You just thought this is how life's supposed to be. And we all know what uh, that constant screen time does that, uh, overexposure to screen time does it can lead to chronic depression you know it can uh, lead to skepticism on life just this idea that everything is it, it's it has no meaning you know and 
So this is what this, ex this generation is experiencing. And anybody that works with that generation, whether it's Damascus or whoever it is, a teacher, you know about this reality, right? You know that there's a generation that, unlike any other, is experiencing massive numbers of these statistics that they should not be experiencing. This is the, like the, literally the time of their lives when they should be the most joyful, the most vibrant, the most hopeful. But yet something in our society is, is upside down. Instead of all those things, they're just depressed. They think there's no, no future. And that, that was the reality even at Asbury, even amongst many of the students, right? But God did something amazing. He, he did not use an amazing uh, speaker that has an amazing platform to come in and like stir them up. No, he used simple people. This, re this outpouring was sparked, like I said, by 19 students who were nobodies. Nobody who knew who they were. Nobody still knows. Like if you did the research, you'd probably know, but not one of those 19 are the ones that follow them are like huge Christian superstars right now. Yeah, they might give some interviews here and there, but they're just normal, everyday Gen Z kids who like, what has our society said? Oh, this generation, they're nothing. Like they're, this is the, like, we should <laughs> repent like of the way we've talked about this generation, how we've spoken word curses over them. And here it was, God was pouring out his grace on this generation. They were the ones leading this. All of those people that came from around the world, they didn't come to see some amazing speaker. They didn't even come to see those kids. They came because they knew the Holy Spirit was there. They came because they knew that Jesus is alive, that I will travel anywhere. I will travel. If God is there, I'm going to go there. And that's what started to happen. So many people started to hear. The testimony started to roll in that depression was being broken off, broken off of people that struggle with depression their whole lives. And they were waking up the next day, boom, totally freed, totally changed, joyful, laughing, crying, repenting, hugging people, a, a new outlook on life. And this was what was happening time and again, time and again, and the testimonies kept rolling in. They kept rolling in, and that's what they would do. They would have a period of testimony. And again, how powerful is testimony? We talk about this all the time, that the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Right? Testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. And this is in Revelation 19.10. And what does that mean? It means that when I testify to what Jesus did in my life, it means that he can do it in your life too. So if Jesus broke drug like me, I go around and I don't know how many times I've told my story of how Jesus broke drug addiction off my life. And people come to me and they go, wow, your testimony inspired me. It gave me hope to realize he can do it again. And I'll see him a year later. Hey, guess what? I'm freed from drug addiction. Why? Is it because I'm amazing? It's because of Jesus. It's because of what Jesus did in me. I, had, I, I couldn't stop sharing it. I was like, I know he did it. I know that was Jesus. I couldn't do it on my own. I shared it with somebody, and it prophesied into somebody's life that they could do the same thing too, that they could overcome addiction. And the same thing started to happen with the Gen Zers. It's like, man, I've struggled. And again, it's such a dark place to be. When you think you're the only person that struggles with that, right? Like I did, I struggled and I thought, I want to keep it hidden. If anybody knew, they would think less of me, all this stuff. And that's what the enemy does. He keep, when, we, when he keeps us in darkness, when he keeps us alone, when we can't share in a vulnerable position, the enemy has us in a stronghold. But something happened at Asbury and it was repentance. It was, a, it was like, no, 
The enemy has no foothold. It's, it's no longer time to live in shame, guilt, condemnation. It's time to say, hey, guess what? I struggle with depression too. And I repent. I repent of my sins. And then people started to, just something happens when you start to confess, right? The power of confessing. We know this as Catholics. We know that when we confess with our lips, that something powerful happens. That no longer the enemy, he hears that confession, right? And he knows he's powerless. So when you confess, confess with that, that belief that Jesus is going to forgive you. That it's no longer, look, I don't have to keep this in darkness anymore. I can, I can be vulnerable. I can bring my sins and I can come as I am. That Jesus loves me as I am in my brokenness. Uh, I don't have to put on a show anymore. And then the Holy Spirit fills you, right? The Holy Spirit <laughs> fills you. So this is what was happening. Like, it would be like this call, like, do you want to repent? And people would come up to this altar right there. And it would just be this just outpouring of grace at that altar. It would be, and again, I was on the prayer teams. I was one of those prayer ministers right there. And literally all I would do is say, what do you want to bring to Jesus? And they would just start telling me this stuff like, oh man, I'm, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 40 years. And I'm a jerk, <laughs> you know, and it's like, I'm, I've like lorded it over people and, and like they just, the Holy Spirit would like fall on. These are like pastors that hadn't felt the, the Holy Spirit moving in their ministry for years. They were dry. They just had nothing left. They were about to give up. And then the Holy Spirit just poured out on them. And this was happening day after day. People were coming to the altar. It was uh, and all, if you really start to study every single revival that has ever happened, this is, this is the, the theme. It's always the word of God. Preaching the simple gospel. Calling people to repentance. And receiving the Holy Spirit. Guys, it's not rocket science. This is like, it was so beautiful. And, it, and people were looking from the outside and they were all skeptical. They're kind of like, ah, well, that can't really be happening, you know. But then they would come. And I don't know many people that left, that came, that left skeptics. Because the Spirit was, was moving people. And there's tens and tens of thousands of testimonies now of lives changed. And I'll end with this. This is so important, and Jotham mentioned this at the beginning, this interruptibility. And we as Catholics that were there at Asbury, we started to re-examine ourselves and say, man, like, are we, why is this happening? Why is this outpouring happening? It's because literally these students were, un, were interruptible, right? These students had better things to do. They had, I mean, you've been, most of you have been through school and you know what it's like to feel the pressure of, I have to get this done, I have to get that done. Uh, there's always something to do. I just don't have time for that. They put that aside. They put that aside just for, just for a little bit of time, even if it was just for, hey, I'm not going to this next class. I feel like God is calling me to sit here and be with him. And it was because of those 19 students being interruptible that God was able to use them. That God was able to entrust his spirit to a group of people. And what about us? Would God entrust his spirit to us if we were interruptible? If we weren't itching to go, like it, it, as soon as the, you know, the priest gives the final blessing and we're already out the door, would we as Catholics be, what if, what if we as Catholics stayed after Mass? And what if like worship started again? Or what if we showed up beforehand and we're like, I can't get